Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. My wife doesn't understand me. Has always been a rather common complaint. And classically, it has been uttered by harried and put-upon husbands who insist that they stray far afield only to enlist the sympathy and commiseration that seems to be denied them at home. And yet, how often do any of these poor, deprived fellows think to put the proposition in reverse and say, I don't understand my wife? Our mystery drama, Crime of Passion, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. I'll be back shortly with Act One. An intelligent woman is a woman with whom one can be as stupid as one wishes. That was the opinion of a learned Frenchman. And since the French are the acknowledged authorities on the games that men and women play, we should listen very carefully. Certainly, history has proved that intelligent women have a hard time in this world, especially when they are married to shallow, heavy-footed men. George Parrish, a night watchman, is coming home very late one night. He opens the door to his apartment, tiptoes inside. He doesn't want to disturb his sleeping wife. But she isn't sleeping. She's very much awake. And there's a man with her. Oh, Millie. Millie. What would I ever do without you? Why, you two tyrants! George! George! Ah! You've got the wrong idea! Don't, George! Please don't! Good morning, Phil. Am I upsetting your schedule? You're destroying it, Tom. Well, being a law firm's top client does give a man privileges. <laughs> Go ahead. The clock is running. I have a case I want you to handle for me. The man's name is Parrish. George Parrish. He came home last night and found his wife with another man, and uh, he shot her dead. I want you to defend him. Why me? Well, before you decided to get rich, you were the best criminal lawyer in the country. Who is Parrish? He's one of my employees. Uh, you know my motto, if you work for Cartwright Industries, be you ever so high or ever so humble, you're my guy and I stand behind you all the way. And this is how you intend to stand behind Parrish? Well, I'm a man of my word. Mm, why not? It's worth a fortune to you in labor relations. Not to mention general publicity. You're an old fraud. <laughs> yeah, sure. But when you've been a fraud for as long as I have, you really become quite sincere about it. Uh, besides, I, uh... Well, I feel I owe him something. What? I feel guilty about it. Why? I, I want you to get on this thing for me, Phil. Tom, you know how busy we are right now. I can recommend the top guy. Phil, I want you. A murder case? Just what I needed. What's new in the paper this morning, dear? Oh, just the usual bad news. Oh. oh I'm sorry, though. About what? I know I shouldn't be reading the paper at breakfast. Oh, that. It's just that I have absolutely no time to myself during the day. I mean, it isn't right. We seem to spend so little time together. I know. But things just seem to keep piling up. Yes, they do. You're being very understanding about it, aren't you? Well, I wasn't aware that I had a choice. Well, you you do manage to keep busy? Oh, yes. There's enough to do. That's what I always said. These days, women should be out there doing. <laughs> what do you know about this? That merger is actually going through. International is going to buy Amertex. Oh, uh, how's the job coming? Oh, it's interesting. And, and how is Frank as a boss? Oh, if you want to learn how to run an art gallery, there's no better teacher. Oh, something fascinating happened just yesterday. Why would International want to acquire Amertex? I mean, they must know it's a company completely enmeshed in legal problems, or do they? Oh, I'm sorry, darling. What you were about to say? Oh, it wasn't important. Uh, will you be home early this evening? It's Bob and Gretchen's anniversary party. Gee, I really don't know what time I can get home, darling. Oh, do you have to work late again? As if things weren't bad enough, Tom Cartwright threw something at me yesterday. Matter of fact, it's right here in the paper. Night watchman shoots wife in jealous rage. Hmm. 
That's very sloppy writing. You can't tell which of them was in the jealous rage. Well, what does this have to do with you? Well, Tom wants me to defend him. Oh, a murder case. I thought those days were over. Well, I never thought I'd miss them. But I tell you, nothing else can pump the adrenaline like a homicide. Huh. I miss those days. You'd come home and spread out all the work on the dining room table, and I'd keep the coffee going and <laughs> type up the notes. And just before dawn, many times, we'd go out to breakfast. Well, you can only do that when you're very, very young. Oh, you talk as if we're very, very old. Well, we were very, very poor. Phil, we were never poor. Well, I mean, you know, compared to what we have today. Hmm. I often wonder. About what? Oh, about everything. Phil, I I'd hate to miss Bob and Gretchen's party. Well, look, why don't you go on and I'll meet you there? Well, if I know you, you won't show up till very late. What'll I do if I get bored and I want to leave early? I'll be stuck. Darling, it's just that I'm always so far behind. You could go by yourself. Mm, I'd have to worry about a taxi late at night. Oh, I know. Frank Hertford. What about him? Ask him to take you. Oh, I don't know. I see enough of him during the day. Frank is tailor-made for the job. He's the perfect extra man. Well, he's really not much fun. He doesn't have to be. All he has to do is be your escort. Thank you, guard. Parrish? I'm Philip Wilcox. I'm your attorney. Parrish? She's dead. Yes, we know she's dead. I killed her. Yes, I have your confession. Yeah, yeah, I confessed. I want to read it to you. I don't want to hear it. You say, I came home early and I caught her with I James Axford. I don't want to listen to it. They were both half-dressed. I knew they'd been together. I got so mad. Don't read anymore. I pulled the gun out of the holster. I was going to kill them both. I fired at her first. Then I was going to shoot him too, but he fought with me. Then other people came into the room. I can't believe she's dead. Is this substantially the way it happened? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's what I said, that's what happened. Did you mean to kill her? I... Uh, I got so mad I couldn't control myself. Next thing I know, the gun is in my hand. Well, you didn't exactly surprise them in what might be called a uh, compromising situation, did you? What's he doing there that hour of the night wearing pajamas and a bathrobe? Who can you trust in this world? Nobody. Just one person. My buddy, Tom Cartwright. Well, he wasn't my buddy exactly. He, he was my... Battalion commander. He knew the name of every guy in the outfit. Now, Parrish. After the war, you, you, you lose track. And he was an officer. I I didn't have an easy life. A lot of things went wrong. Now, look, here's what we have to assess. I was hitting 57, 58. And what's the best I could do? Night watchman for this big company. Did you at any time prior to the moment that you One saw night, them together? These, these important guys come in seeing this big white-haired fella. He looks at me and he says... Hey, I know you, George Parrish, B Company, Rifleman. Did you have any reason to suspect they were having he an said, affair? Look, George, any time you feel you're not getting the right deal, you just come and see me. Parrish? That's... I have to know that's this. how he always was, Big Tom Cartwright. <laughs> hey, you must be the smartest lawyer in the United States of America because that's just who Tom said he'd get me. Answer this. Did you have any reason to suspect that they were having an affair? No. Who is James Axford? A ah, runny little guy. He lived down the hall. He'd sit around with us and drink coffee. You want to know how stupid I was? I'll tell you. I used to think it was great that he'd drop in to keep a company while I was working. You mean you didn't suspect anything? Suspect what? He looked like a light breeze could blow him right over. Besides, she... She wasn't all that young or, or great-looking. I mean, how could I figure she'd even be thinking of that kind of thing? How, how could this happen to me? I tried to give her everything. All right, Parrish. I think I have enough for now. Maybe I should have spent more time with her. You know how women are. They, they want you around all the time, but what was I going to do? I had to work nights and part time. I couldn't help it. Why couldn't she understand that? Mm. <coughs> oh. oh. <coughs> uh, hello. Uh, Phil. Uh, Phil, it's Tom. Now, I know it's a bit late, but uh, I 
actually. It's only past midnight. Oh, I, I guess I dozed off. Yeah, I've been trying to reach you all evening. Uh, did you see George Parrish? Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, how does it look? It looks good. Hey, that's great. You know, in cases like these, you usually have to explain the gun. You know, if he didn't mean to use it, why did he have it? Well, he had to carry it on the job. Exactly. And that's a big plus. So we'll go for something in the neighborhood of um, guilty due to temporary insanity. Well, I think that that's exactly what did happen. So uh, you're telling me that he'll do okay? Unless something unforeseen comes up. Like what? <laughs> if I could tell you, it wouldn't be unforeseen, would it? I, I appreciate this, Phil. I, I want to help him. Oh, I'm sorry if I disturbed you. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good morning, dear. Pour you some coffee? Oh, please. Oh, you look tired. Well, I had a restless night. You're always nervous with case. With case? Yeah. <laughs> like a woman is with child. Yeah, well, I'm with case, all right. Oh, tough one? Well, it looks open and shut, but those are usually the ones that have a hidden booby trap somewhere. Something bothering you about it? Yes. What? Well, that's the trouble. I don't know what. You must have come home rather late last night. Mm-hmm. I guess we all lost track of the time. Oh? Oh, it was a marvelous party. Everyone hated to see it end. What time did it break up? Oh, it was before midnight. I was still up around midnight. I didn't hear you come in. You know what happened. Frank and I walked home. You walked home? That's right. All the way from Bob and Gretchen's? At that hour? Well, that was very foolish. You're right. Why'd you do it? Darling, you're looking at this in the cold, clear light of the morning. But it was such a beautiful night. You have to admit that. I'm afraid I didn't notice. There was a kind of magic in the air. Magic? What kind of magic? Oh, you should know. You're the one who first told me about the magic in the night air. I did? Don't you remember? In the air of the night are all the gossamer dreams and fragile fancies. They wither and die in the glare of the burning, brilliant sun. But in the soft and kindly glow of the friendly moon... Huh. Oh, I often wonder. You, you know, you never told me. Did you read that somewhere, or did you actually write it? I don't even remember. I think you wrote it. You used to write a lot of poetry while you were going to law school. I remember you said that it was the only way that you could keep your sanity. Oh, I was just a kid. And one of the greatest lawyers in the world, Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, was a fine poet. Margaret, getting back to this foolishness. I mean, walking all that way in the dead of night. Well, you and I used to walk at night for hours. I remember. Yeah, but those were different times. Yes. I thought you said you found Frank Hertford rather dull. I never said that. Didn't you say he wasn't much fun? Oh, yes. But that's only during the day, at the gallery. He's all business there, which is good. But away from the gallery, he has an entirely different personality. Really? Yes. He's very lively and witty. There's a whole side to Frank Hertford that I've never been aware of. <laughs> line, let's take a break and see how things seem to be shaping up in our little drama. Of course, there's always the possibility that we might be reading a bit too much into what we've been hearing so far. On the other hand, we may not be reading enough. We'll just have to wait for Act Two for a clearer definition. to know offhand who it was that said nature abhors a vacuum it has a scientific sound to it so you might assume it was a physicist but the fact is it was stated by a philosopher and he wasn't thinking of things like vacuum tubes and the like because they hadn't yet been invented no what he had in mind were human affairs and what people will do if their lives are empty Hi, Terry. Hey, Phil. Late as usual. Yeah, it's like old times. We're going to lock horns again. Uh, why don't you come downtown and really practice law? Why don't you come uptown and really make some money when I get old? Then you won't be able to enjoy it. Say, I hear you guys are raking it in. Uh, however... However what? You're basically a one-client law firm. Now, what if you lose him? 
lose Tom Cartwright. Ah, we're too involved with everything he's got going. It's as if we were welded together. How could we lose him? Well, the outfit that had him before you did lost him. <laughs> Thanks, you just made my day. Yeah, all right. Now, uh, getting down to cases. The George Parrish thing now. This is the quintessential crime of passion. That's your story. Well, you admit that it's open and shut. I don't have to admit anything. Oh, why don't we save the taxpayers' money? Oh? You want a plea bargain? Look, why don't you ask for manslaughter? And we can wind up with guilty because of temporary insanity. Oh, how nice of you. And for you, too. You get the word guilty in the verdict. I'm going for murder one. You have to be kidding. The public perception of these uh, insanity things, it's completely negative these days. You see, man on the street thinks all you have to do after you kill somebody is have a smart lawyer claim you were temporarily insane and you beat the rap. But I do have temporary insanity here. Oh, do you? Yes, I can get psychiatric testimony that says so. Oh, I can get psychiatric testimony that says you don't. All right, so our shrinks cancel each other out. And what's left is this poor, pathetic-looking, put-upon slob. He's your hard-working, hard-luck guy who never got a break. And a war veteran, too. Ah, uh, that doesn't carry the cloud of use. He's got a purple heart. Yeah. Probably shot himself cleaning his rifle. So, what? Your client is lying. Well, I believe him. I don't. Why not? He walks into his house, all unsuspecting. And he's suddenly confronted by the infidelity of his wife. Now, in a sudden, wild, uncontrolled fit of rage, he shoots her. You're stating my case. And it's a lie. No man, or woman for that matter, is ever unaware of infidelity. Come on, Terry, how can you say that? You mean a fellow doesn't always know his wife is being unfaithful, hmm? How could he know? <laughs> Are you telling me if Margaret were having an affair... Uh, you wouldn't know about it? Margaret would never have an affair. Oh? Why not? Well, she's not the type. Uh -huh. Well, what is the type? I mean, and besides, I mean, realistically, she's older. Older? Look, the truth is, why would anyone want to have an affair with Margaret? Have you seen her lately? Well, as a matter of fact, at the gallery. See, my wife dragged me there to look at some art. And just last week. Oh, she looks great. Yeah. Now, look, getting back to your basic point. Uh, which is, a man has to know that his wife is having an affair. He has to notice the change in her. What change? Well, she treats him better, or she treats him worse. She's either laughing or crying. Or she's light as a feather or heavy as a rock. See, but whatever she is, she is different. And you claim a man can see that? Well, see it, hear it, feel it. Now, he knows it. But he may categorically reject that information. Why? Because if he faced up to it, he'd be forced to make a move. A move that might uh, change the world he lives in. And, uh, maybe he simply can't handle it. So if you're right, why didn't my client go on evading the issue? Why did he kill her? Because you can only lie to yourself for so long and no longer. You see, you're taking a terrible psychological beating. You have to blow up. And suddenly, something happens, which may be completely unrelated to the marriage. But it's a terrible trauma, and that's when a guy goes home and makes her pay for it. Well, you'd better be able to prove that to our 12 good people in true. That's why we're having a trial, isn't it? Phil? Is that you? Yeah. You didn't say you were coming home, so I didn't bother with dinner. Oh, well, I... Hey, look at you. <laughs> you like the dress? I don't know. Well, it's a bit uh, daring. Oh, now, Phil. Well, I mean, let me put it this way. You usually dress with an eye toward uh, suggestion rather than display. Well, I hardly think you could call this display. Well, for you, it's, it's certainly something new. New? I've been dressing more or less like this since, oh, it's been over a year now. I never noticed. Well, actually, Phil... You're very rarely home. Well, it has been a hectic time. I'm sure you understand that. Of course. You see me mostly at breakfast, and then I'm in my robe and my hair isn't done. No, 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 just wait a minute. What did you just say, that I only see you at breakfast? Mm-hmm. We have breakfast together, and you leave the house. Then you generally come home very late for dinner. Darling, we are swamped in the office. Oh, of course. So when you do come home, I'm ready for bed. Sometimes I'm already asleep. But you do look different. Mm-hmm. I would hope so. I mean, you haven't really consulted me. I mean, what I mean is, you know, every time you buy a new dress or decide on a, on a different hairdo, you'd always ask my opinion. Darling, how long has it been since my hairdo or my clothes have been of any interest to you? Actually, 
You've become careless about my appearance. Certainly you've been much less strict lately, much less demanding. Well, I have had some very important concerns. Well, maybe my appearance isn't as important to you as it once was. Oh, now, come on, Margaret. Well, if there's nothing personal in this, it's just a basic truism of married life in a great many marriages. Well, now that you're all dressed up, are you going somewhere? Mm -hmm. We're having a special showing at the gallery tonight. Oh. It's going to be quite an event. Why don't you come along? Oh, I'm not sure I'd fit in with the sort of people who'll be there. Well, most of them are very nice people. And the truth is, I simply have to finish some work. You know, if you keep this up, then the work is going to finish you. Uh, why, Why not take a night off? The truth is, honey, I'm just too tired. I mean, do you have to go? It's a very important evening. Frank is depending on me. Oh. Don't worry, dear. Frank will see to it that I get home all right. Yeah. What's that, Miss Sidings? I have a lunch date with Tom Carteret. Oh, that's right. That's right. Thanks for reminding me. Ah, let's see now. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <clears throat> from time to time we are shocked, rudely awakened. We look at our advanced state of sophisticated civilization and we are horrified when we realize how thin is the, the veneer, the, the veneer of, veneer of what? We've already said civilization, sophistication, cultivation, advancement. Let's see, now where is that book? Why can't I ever find anything? Miss Tidings, where's my thesaurus? Why does everything always disappear? Please, I don't want any excuses. I just want the book. Oh, for crying out loud. Miss Tidings, I'm sorry. It's right here on my desk. A- and look, call Mr. Cartwright for me. Say that something extremely vital has suddenly come up and I have to cancel lunch. <laughs> May I help you? Yes, I'm looking for Margaret Wilcox. Uh, Did you have an appointment with Mrs. Wilcox? Well, I don't usually make appointments with Mrs. Wilcox. I'm Mr. Wilcox. Oh, uh, how do you do, sir? Um, Was uh, was Mrs. Wilcox expecting you? Well, it's just that I happened to be in the neighborhood and thought I'd drop by and take her to lunch. Oh, uh, well, they're not here at the gallery just now. They? Uh, Margaret and Frank Hertford. I think they said they were going to Philadelphia to look at the work of a new artist. Oh, Well, it was uh, just a spur-of-the-moment thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, How are we doing, Counselor? Mr. Parrish, I have to ask you one question. You sure should. Did you have any idea that your wife had been unfaithful to you with this Axford fellow before you found them together that night? You already asked me that. Well, I'm asking again. I told you before. I never knew. Is that possible? Is what possible? That a man wouldn't know? Sure, it's possible. But, Parrish, in a thing like this, there are signs, unmistakable signs. Uh, Maybe, but what do you do if you're too dumb to read them? Too dumb, too trusting, maybe... Maybe too happy. Now, listen, I'm your lawyer. You must tell me the truth. I'm telling you the truth. The worst thing you can do is lie to your lawyer. Why do you keep saying I'm lying? I'm not saying that you're lying. I'm only asking you not to do it. I'm building your whole case... On a proposition that you didn't know what was happening. I'm telling you the truth. Now, just remember, if you're not, I can get blindsided, ambushed and destroyed in that courtroom. All I stand to lose is the case. I'll go on to something else, but you won't. Look, do you think I'd have held still for it? I'm not that kind of a guy. When I found out about what she was doing, I put an end to it. Right then, right there. Did you ever argue with your wife? How can you be married and not argue with your wife? Loud, angry arguments that the neighbors could have overheard? No, no, never. I mean, I have to make sure that they can't spring a witness on us to testify that he heard the two of you having some serious shouting matches. Whoever says anything like that would be lying. All right, that's what I have to know. So, uh, how... how does it look? If you're telling me the truth, you've got a chance. Oh. Been visiting your client, I see. Terry, do you actually believe that you can get him on murder one? Yeah. You have to prove premeditation. I know. 
Well, it's awfully tough in a case like this. That's true. You're really sticking your neck out. That's what your neck is for, buddy. Well, you must think you have something. You ever read a play by James M. Barry? Now what are you trying to pull on me? It's called What Every Woman Knows. What about it? Well, he makes a very big deal about how completely a woman understands the man she's married to. So what? Well, women don't have any monopoly on that kind of insight. They just brag about it more. I still don't know what you're talking about. If I were writing a play instead of constructing a case, you know what I'd call it? What every husband knows. Yeah? What does he know? Ha uh ha. -huh. What doesn't he know? That is, once he sits down and really starts asking himself the right question. Well, what does a husband know? It does seem that many husbands these days know very little. Strangely enough, it would appear that there are those husbands who don't even know what their wives look like. So how can we hope for a deeper understanding? But is this true? Probably on a conscious level. But what's happening deep down there in the subconscious? That's where the action is. We have Act 3 for that purpose. wedlock, which is used to define the married state. Wedlock is derived from an old Gothic word which means a pledge or a contract. And that's what marriage is really about, no? A contractual agreement. But there's always a basic dissatisfaction with contracts in general these days. One of the parties is always looking to get out of it somehow. Oh, Phil, you're home. Yes, these days, it seems I can get more done here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Had I known I'd have come back earlier. I, I just thought you'd be out till late at one of your meetings. What do you mean, one of my meetings? Well, you do have meetings. Well, I know, but you make it sound as, as if there's something disreputable about it. Darling, are we going to quarrel? You know, I stopped by the gallery today. Hmm, I heard. To take you to lunch. Oh, that was sweet. But you weren't there. Well, Frank and I went to Philadelphia. There was this marvelous new artist on exhibit. You know, it's now nine o'clock. The exhibition must have lasted till late. No, just till five. Oh, but it's such a lovely drive this time of the year. We enjoyed the foliage. You remember how you and I used to go out to the country and see how the leaves were all turning color? And then, of course, Frank and I stopped off at this marvelous little country inn for dinner. Margaret, is that wise? Wise? I mean, people might... <laughs> what is it, Phil? Oh, I, uh, I just remembered I had Faraday look up a case for me, People versus Gibbs. I think there's an application there. I'd better call him right now. Uh, Phil. Phil, you got a minute? Oh, come in, come in, Tom. Sit down. Well, thank you. I, uh, I don't see you at the club. I, uh, don't see you anywhere these days. And what's this? A sandwich at the desk? I'm in the middle of a murder case, remember? Uh, and uh, you'll get him off, won't you? Well, a man doesn't get off in a situation like this. He still has to pay a price. Well, okay, a couple of years, maybe. Uh, that's the same as getting off, isn't it? Well, you're worried, aren't you? I always worry when I'm in court. Sure, sure. He, he killed his wife. But it was in a fit of sudden blind rage. You know, in that single terrible moment, his whole world collapsed. Now, he'd worshipped that woman. That's your defense, isn't it? That's right. Well, it sounds great to me. What could be wrong with it? I don't know. Well, are you saying there is something wrong with it? I don't know that either. And what's wrong with you? Terry McLean. Oh. Your district attorney friend. Mm-hmm. I don't like his attitude, Tom. He wouldn't have gone for first-degree murder if he didn't hold something up his sleeve. Well, uh, something like... Uh, He's like just a bit too confident. Oh, come on. There are guys who can sit with a nothing hand and make you believe they're holding four aces. Look, I know, Terry. He's got something. What? Premeditation. George Parrish isn't that kind of guy. 
What kind of guy? Who'd put up with his wife fooling around. The guy with guts doesn't do that. And that's the thing George always had. He got the silver star. I, I was there when he earned but it. But we're talking about different things. We are talking about a red-blooded guy who reacted in, in a way that's unfortunately all too human. I used to think that myself. But it isn't so simple. Here you are in a well-ordered world. You become aware of something that threatens your entire existence. That is, if you choose to confront it. Well, you have to confront it. You have no choice. You do. You can choose to disregard it and pretend it doesn't exist. Well, tell me, what, what real guy could accept a situation where he knows his wife is cheating on him? A real guy who happens to be in love with her. Phil, Phil, I don't know what the DA has, but you have to win this case. I am telling you that right now. If Terry has premeditation, I'll have to perform a miracle. Well, if that's what is needed, that's what you are getting paid for. Uh, do you mind if I sit down here? It's a public bench in a municipal park. <laughs> Beautiful day, isn't it? Um, excuse me... I, I see you're busy with your own thoughts. I have no right to intrude, but... I had this idea that I should talk to you because your name is... Philip Wilcox, isn't it? How do you know me? Oh, you're a lawyer and a very good one. You're defending a man named George Parrish who murdered his wife. Oh, you must have seen my picture in the paper. At first I thought I'd visit you in your office. Why? But I didn't have the nerve... And then I noticed you would come down here and sit in the park for a few minutes each day at, at noontime. What's on your mind? I know something about the Parrish murder case that you're unaware of. Oh, yes? There was nothing between James Axford and Millicent Parrish. Oh, there was a great deal between them, but nothing carnal or fleshly or, or, or sexual. How do you know? Because... Because of the type of man that James Axford happens to be, he, he was completely lacking in th that type of orientation. Is that a fact? Yes. Then why was he in her apartment at two in the morning in his robe and pajamas? He needed comfort. Comfort? Yes. James Axford is a man who suffers from loneliness. He was unable to sleep. He, he was... Frightened. Of what? Of the world, of everything, of anything, of nothing. And and so he went to her and she spoke to him as she always did. Always? She was always ready with a comforting word, a, a cheering thought. She was so filled with life that she had so much to give. And the stupid, stolid, ignorant ox she was married to just didn't take any of it. He was never home, always trying to find a, a fortune. Didn't he know he had one in the house? How do you know so much about this? Oh, I'm sure by this time you know who I am. Yes, she comforted me. Toward the end, I had to comfort her. Why? She was worried about him. For what reason? He was afraid he'd lose his job. But I know Tom Cartwright. Tom would never fire him. Oh, but he did. Why do you say that? Do you know it for a fact? George must have been fired. That's why he came home and shot her. Funny. He says he shot her because of me. And I had never had anything to do with her. In that way. But in a sense... In a real sense... I was getting her ready for another man. I was awakening her to the, the, the possibilities of the world. A woman like her with all that imagination, all that life. She has so much to give. If her husband doesn't want to take it, she has to find someone who will. Why are you telling me all this? Oh, because I have a sense of humor. I'm a waiter. The other day I worked at a big party. The most beautiful woman there, I thought, was a... a Mrs. Philip Wilcox. Mrs. Wilcox? I saw she was there without her husband. Well, the story is she goes everywhere without her husband. I saw how the men looked at her. 
so, who is better equipped than you to be the defense attorney in this type of murder case? Tom, I have to talk to you. Uh, well, I can't now. I'm, I'm flying to Chicago. Sit down. Just wait a minute. You can't just barge into my office. Tom, the day he killed his wife, did you fire George Parrish? Uh, no. What kind of a question is that? If the answer is yes, my whole defense collapses. Uh, th 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 there's uh, no way a thing like that could come out, is there? Oh, boy. Well, who would bring it up? George wouldn't. How did you fire him? Oh, I said, well, I, uh, I called my secretary and I said, oh, good Lord. And she must have called personnel. Now it's a matter of record. No wonder my DA friend Terry's been going around with that Mona Lisa smile on his face. I, uh, I told you he got the silver star. It was for saving my life under fire. Great. So why did you give him the sack? Because he'd been stealing. Though I didn't mind. I mean, what did it add up to? A couple of hundred now and then. But the foreman and the other fellas, they were wise to it, so I, I, I had to stop it. Now, I said, George, you have to cut it out. If you need extra dough, just come to see me. So shouldn't that have ended it? No. No, he kept on stealing, uh, taking advantage of me, making me look like a chump to the other guys. And so I called him in. I blew my stack and I said, get out of here. He turned pale as a sheet of paper. Well, I, I guess he must have nursed it for a while. Then he went home and he killed her. Who else did he have to take it out on? The D.A. knows about it. He has to. But you see, he, he didn't kill her. I did. I made him do it. And I should have given him another kind of job. But what? He wasn't good for anything else. Tom, there's no way I can save him. But you have to. I cannot do the humanly impossible. I don't recognize words like humanly impossible. And I don't have to. Because I pay top dollar. And all I know is, I want results. Why, well, I'm glad you're home. I thought I'd better be. I was in the courtroom today. I didn't see you. I heard you make the charge to the jury. What'd you think? I thought it was magnificent. Mm, but it didn't help. I'm going to lose the case. That's too bad. What do I smell? Chili. Your special chili consolation dinner. Huh? Well, if it were a victory dinner, it would be filet mignon. <laughs> How well you remember. Oh, it hasn't been all that long ago. That seems like another world, Margaret. You know, there was just no way I could save George Parrish. I'm sorry. I guess a jury will stay out all night just for the sake of form, but... They'll come back and throw the book. Well, at least I saved myself. From what? From doing something later... Something? Hmm, something I, um, I wouldn't be able to control. Something I'd be forced to do. Tell me. No. Should we have secrets from each other? Yes, certain secrets. There are certain things I, I don't want you to ask me, and there are certain things that I won't ask you about either. I, I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. Oh, I think you do. But we're going to end it, Margaret, because things will be different from now on. You know, I, I love the way you wear your hair. <laughs> You're right, you know. I haven't been too aware of it. Tell me, when was the last time that we took a trip? I can't remember. Would you like to go somewhere this week? Can you get away? Certainly. Won't Tom, your important client, be needing you? Tom is going to fire me. Why? Because I will have lost the case. Well, how, how could he fire you for losing? Oh, he could, easily. Just like that? No, yeah, well, it won't be just like that. It'll take a while. He'll start showing dissatisfaction with this, that, and the other thing. Before you know it, we'll be through. But losing the case for George Parrish would be where it all began. Well, what are you going to do? Well, for starters, I'd like to spend some more time with my wife. That is, if she's not going to be too busy. I think I can find time for you, darling. Um, Phil. Yes? About... Frank Hertford. I don't want to hear about Frank Hertford. But, but I, I feel I ought to. Darling, let's go inside and have dinner. No. Let me put the chili in the freezer. This is the kind of dinner that calls for filet mignon. And there? 
there the matter must rest. Mr. Phil Wilcox, an astute attorney and a capable judge of human nature, including his own, would agree wholeheartedly with the following dictum. If a man has a charming, attractive wife and he pays no attention to her, he has only himself to blame if other men do. I'll be back shortly. The crime of passion, so frequently encountered in both literature and life, seems so sharply defined, so easily comprehended, so basic, so uncomplicated. But is it? Men and women are complex creatures who will always act in their own self-interest. And sometimes, a sudden burst of blind fury can have been created by many years of clear-eyed preparation deep in the subconscious, where everything is finally decided for all of us. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Carol Titel, Earl Hammond, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.